At this time, we are pleased to welcome our presenter, Kurt Walling. Robin Dewey from the Labor Occupational Health Program is here to introduce our speaker. Program. LOHP is a program of the Center for Occupational and Environmental Health within the School of Public Health here at UC Berkeley. Our focus is on working with workers, um, worker organizations, employers, and others, all with the goal of promoting safe and healthful workplaces for employees in our state. Uh, we have several training projects, including one focused on addressing the health and safety issues school employees face on the job, which is called the School Action for Safety and Health, or SASH, project. Um, SASH is funded by our state's Commission on Health and Safety and Workers' Compensation. And our speaker today uh, sits on the advisory committee for our SASH project. I am very happy to in introduce our speaker, Kurt Walling. Kurt is the loss prevention director for this uh, Shasta, yeah, Shasta Trinity Schools Insurance Group, excuse me, um, a joint powers authority, or JPA, in Northern California, consisting of 37 school districts. He's also an OSHA authorized outreach instructor, a PROACT trainer, an ALICE active shooter instructor, a certified playground and safety inspector, and a certified school risk manager. He has an undergraduate degree in business, a master's of public policy administration degree, and a master's of science and education degree. He leverages his 26 years in the military as a paratrooper in the infantry, infantry and combat engineers to develop training and safety programs that benefit school employees. We're thrilled to have him here. Thank you for joining us. Kurt? Hi, Robin. Thanks a lot, and uh, I really appreciate everyone's attendance today. So we're just going to go ahead and get right into this. We've got about 45 minutes to go over these slides and uh, to listen to a 911 call uh, that uh, occurred during Columbine. So uh, what we're going to go over today, I'll give you a brief introduction. We're going to talk about active shooter policies. and You will all be afforded an opportunity to get a, a, a draft active shooter policy in a format that you can modify for your own school district. Uh, it can even be uh, adapted for use for uh, organizations out sky, outside of schools. Um, we'll talk about ALICE, which is just one of many different types of uh, response protocols for dealing with an active shooter incident. We'll also talk about run, hide, fight. That's the Department of Homeland Security's answer to uh, active shooter incident. We'll talk about different trainings you can do, and then uh, one thing that I, I really like to, to stress while we're doing this training is usually this is all about reaction, but we need to be proactive and remember that there's a way to prevent these. And that's actually the very best thing that we can do for our schools and for ourselves and for our students and even our families is pay attention and prevent active shooter incidents in the first place. I'll try and give you some resources for that as well. Uh, as Robin told you, I am a loss prevention director for a JPA, a Joint Powers Authority. Uh, JPA essentially is a nonprofit, self funded insurance group that is run by a public entity in the state of California. These groups were authorized by the California State Legislature back in the 70s when school districts and fire departments and police departments just simply became too expensive to insure, so insurance companies were leaving the state of California. Um, since it's nonprofit and self-funded, whenever these organizations experience a loss due to a preventable workplace injury, that money comes right out of their operating budget. Uh, and so risk managers are hired for these JPAs to ensure that all these injuries that are preventable and these illnesses that are preventable are in fact reduced just to save the district's money. Uh, so that's that's what I do. I, I go to uh, my 37 school districts and I teach uh, about 40 different safety trainings and active shooter training is just one of the trainings that I teach. Uh, this this whole thing started several years ago when our county superintendent of education asked me to get certified as an ALICE instructor and to start teaching these classes and since then we've had several dozen of our school districts uh, do a blended learning approach where they'll go online and take the ALICE online training and then I'll come and follow that up with uh, actual hands-on scenario-based training at their school site. We can talk more about that later. Um, one thing I have to 
kind of put out there up front is this isn't a discussion on politics and we're not going to discuss gun laws uh, or whether it you know it would be helpful to have more guns in schools or less guns in schools um, the bottom line is that bill ab422 was released last year which took away a superintendent's authority to allow people anyone to have a gun on campus so the only ones the only people allowed to have a, a a weapon on campus is actually a uniformed peace officer and there's a few other like uh, armored car guards and, and, and so so on but the bottom line is we're, we're not going to be able to solve that problem we're not going to be able to discuss that problem so what i want to do is i want to just focus on the safety of the employees uh, focusing on the safety of the employees it should it should go without saying that we're also going to focus on the safety of the students because that's what this all boils down to. Um, when we're talking about safety for students, you know, I'm going to have to talk to you guys about some distressing facts from previous uh, active shooter incidents that have occurred at schools. Um, I do not mean to uh, upset anyone. Uh, I do have to uh, play a, a short audio clip of the 911 call from Columbine. Uh, sometimes that's distressing, but uh, you can just mute it. It only lasts a few minutes, and uh, no one is shot. You can't even hear the gunfire, but it, it occurs in the library. So I just want to make sure that you're aware of what's coming up. One other thing that I like to impress upon students in my classes is that these skills apply everywhere you go, not just to you, and not just to uh, you know your coworkers or the students at, at school, but if you think about the recent acting, active shooting incidents that have taken place across the country, many of them occur outside of school, outside of work even. Uh, in Aurora, Colorado, uh, shooting took place in a theater. Um, you know, in, uh, in Las Vegas, a horrible active shooting incident occurred at an outdoor country western concert. So I really want you to think about this globally. And when you go home, talk to your, your friends, your family, and your spouse, and discuss ways to stay safe. Uh, it's not about being hypervigilant or you know crazy, but personally, when I go into a restaurant, I don't like to sit with my back to the door. I like to be aware of where the exits are. Uh, and these are things you should probably talk to your, your family about, like I said. So as far as disclosures go, I am a gun owner. I own several weapons. Um, I spent 26 years in the Air Army Airborne Infantry. I'm a Ranger qualified paratrooper. Uh, I served in Iraq. Um, I've been teaching for many years. I was a tactical officer at the United States Military Academy at West Point. Uh, I spent five years there. I was a regimental executive officer there as well. I was also the department head of the military science department at Simpson University and taught there for six years. Uh, I earned my teaching credential going through uh, the, the six years at Simpson University kind of hand in hand because I knew I'd have to grow up someday and get a real job and get out of the army. Um, and I hold education uh, and students, whether they're, you know, elementary school, high school, adult, students, I, I hold them in very high regard. You know, I take this very personally. Uh, I'm, a, I'm also a, a dad, I'm a father, and I'll tell you right now, I do not like teaching this class. This class, to me, is troublesome. Uh, I, I, as a father and a teacher, it bothers me a great deal that we have to talk about this. So, at the end of the day, I, I, I review these shooting statistics, and then I buckle myself in, and I just keep thinking that perhaps someday, somehow, through these classes, if I can prevent one injury or one shooting victim, then you know I've, I've served the purpose that I really intend to. Uh, I'm an active shooter trainer, and I do this uh, as often as I can. Um, and I'll tell you, most people, from my opinion, are not qualified to carry a weapon in public. Uh, whether or not they have a concealed carry permit, or their uh, prior military even. I, I just don't think that uh, having more weapons in public is necessarily a safety factor. It doesn't increase safety. Um, again, we're not gonna talk a whole lot about that. 
when we get down here to the bottom of the slide, I believe traditional lockdowns are a bad policy. Um, if you look at throughout the historical uh, active shooting incidents, you, you can kind of see a very clear line of uh, accident, you know, Ill injuries uh, at the school districts being higher when their policy is, either they don't have a policy or when their policy is just to sit down, turn off the lights, lock the door and just hope for the best. Um, according to Alice, lockdowns came about in the 1970s and for good reason. Uh, in the 1970s, there was a whole lot of uh, gang, 1970s and 80s actually, there was a whole lot of gang activity in Los Angeles. So what would happen is there would be some gangbangers driving up and down the street, shooting at each other, and bullets were flying. And so what would happen is the schools that are in these big, heavy masonry buildings, they turn off the lights, they keep the students away from the windows, they get them down low, and then when the danger had passed, they could go you know, all clear, they would go ahead and they would turn lights back on and go about their business. That was the lockdown. Uh, so lockdowns have become kind of the same thing for all incidents now. And uh, so what we're trying to do is we're trying to get away from that. I'm going to discuss that quite a bit as we go through these slides. Most importantly, we have to talk about what an active shooter or active killer is now. Um, they've been changing the term active shooter uh, throughout the years because they realized that some of these, some of these incidents, it could be a, a bomb incident. It could be, a, uh, it could be someone with a knife. Uh, it could be a, just someone running around trying to, to hit people with a sledgehammer. There's all kinds of different active killer scenarios. So what they've kind of gone to is uh, the, the terminology is now active threat. So it's, it's up to you and your district and, and who you deal with on a daily basis as to what terminology that you use. Just don't be confused about what the actual definition of an active shooter is. The definition, definition of an active shooter is someone who is engaged in killing or attempting to kill someone in a confined space. So if you think about that for a minute, and you think about back to the 70s and 80s when there were gang shootings outside of the school and they weren't coming into the shoot, school to shoot anyone, that doesn't really meet the definition of an active shooter. Of course, when you start thinking about Columbine, and Sandy Hook, uh, that is clearly someone inside your school walking around attempting to kill someone in an, in an enclosed environment. Okay, so two different things. One of the things that we uh, do is we will go into a lockdown policy when we don't know what's going on, which is also common sense. So if there was a car that backfired outside, it sounded like a gunshot, you should feel comfortable calling for a lockdown to assess what's going on. Uh, Lockdown is a vital component to Alice and run, hide, fight, but you can't confuse the two. An active shooter policy is not a lockdown policy. So terminology is important here. Uh, a lockdown policy is not appropriate for all threats, and that's the bottom line. One of the things that's most important when we're talking about our active shooter policy is that communication is key and essential. If you look at Alice, um, ALICE is the acronym, which I'll discuss in a few minutes, but two out of the five components of ALICE is communication. It's about transmitting information from one person to another or gaining information so you can make a decision, okay? This is an options-based program where instead of sitting on the floor, as in the old-fashioned lockdown policy scenario, you now, as an individual, a teacher or an administrator, you have an ability now to make a decision to do something else that would be safer for you and your students in the long run. The goal of an active shooter policy is to minimize loss of life. It's imperative that you teach and train on these practices. Just this year, there is a new assembly bill released and uh, it's assembly bill 1264, and it requires something called a tactical response plan uh, for all schools. Now, it's part of the comprehensive school safety plan, but this tactical response plan is actually just a nice way of saying an active shooter plan. Uh, it requires a 
a policy and planning and preparation based on specific needs and context of each school and community, which means it's up to you whether you train on scenario-based training. It's, um, it's up to you uh, the depth that you go into this this tactical response plan, but it is part of the new comprehensive school safety plan. And uh, so it's also can be found in ed code 32286. If anyone's curious and wants to look up the exact uh, wording for this. Another interesting thing about this is that your active shooter policy uh, tactical response plan, it can actually be redacted. So you don't have to disclose certain aspects of your plan to the public. This is a common worry that if you have a plan that tells everyone in the school where they're going to meet in case of an active shooter scenario, the active shooter is simply going to show up there. But 8680 specifically gives you the right to redact and not disclose those aspects that you would like to keep secret. So whether or not you train is kind of up to you. Uh, I will tell you that being proactive is better than being reactive. You have to remember uh, what, when you start thinking about training, when you start thinking about why we do things in schools, uh, the last time a student was killed in a school fire was in 1954. Uh, that's because we have uh, fire drills and we have uh, inspections and we have uh, fire extinguishers every 75 feet. Um, we train on it, we train on it, we train on it. So it's safe. When you start thinking of that and you look at all the active shooting incidents, then you kind of have to start wondering why don't we do active shooter training as well? So teaching and training practices is key. Also, law enforcement is typically not going to be on campus. Uh, response times can vary anywhere from two to two to three minutes if you have a school resource officer on site to 20 to 30 minutes for rural schools. Um, if you don't have a first responder on site to immediately take care of your active shooter situation, then the, the teachers and the staff are going to be the first responders. There's no other way to put it. So the staff has to know how to respond to an active shooter incident. And the key here is they have to have options. They have to be able to do more than sit on the floor against the wall and hope for the best. Remember, no single response fits all active shooter situations. You can't just go ahead and say, well, every time there's an active shooter on campus, we're gonna run. Uh, it's not gonna work that way. You, you can't say every time there's an active shooter, we're going to lock down, we're gonna, we're gonna hide in the, in the bathroom, you know, in, in the back of the classroom because schools will catch on fire. Um, Active shooters will come and go. Uh, you'll have students that, that are injured. You have to evacuate. There's all kinds of different issues you have to take into consideration. The key here is making sure that your employees know their options for response. Okay? This is a sensitive topic. Nobody likes to talk about it. And that's why, uh, even though Columbine happened in 1999, the U.S. Department of Education took all the way until 2000. 14 to adopt the run hide fight. Okay. So historically, we look at the lockdowns as being inadequate. They have a place, but they are not the go to reaction. Um, we also have to realize that there has been an increase in threat. Typically, the active shooters uh, fit a general profile, but there is no specific outline as to what an active shooter is and who, why they are who they are. Uh, many of the active shooters study previous active shooting situations and try and one-up the previous one. Uh, so you can't say there's been an increase in threat. There's not a lot of great options. Now, I'll just throw this right out there. It, there what we're trying to do is we're trying to stop or avoid being shot by someone who's armed when we have no weapons. We have nothing to respond with. Remember that there's no law requiring this training. Cal OSHA is developing regulations. Uh, California, as with most things, is first in the nation trying to develop this training. Uh, 
So when you start talking about doing training or developing an active shooter policy, you're going to have to remember to train as you fight. This is a military term that we use quite often. Uh, you want to make sure that when you're training, you're doing things the way that you would do it in a real situation, which is why I like the, the uh, scenario-based trainings. If all you ever do is sit around and talk about what you would do without actually going through the procedures, you, you're not going to know that doors in certain classrooms swing outward instead of inward, so you can't barricade them. Uh, you're not going to know that uh, windows aren't big enough to get students out of. Uh, every time I do one of these trainings, the teachers involved identify a bunch of interesting things about their site they didn't know about before. So it's extremely important to do scenario-based training if you can. <clears throat> one of the big issues we have to deal with when we are uh, under under stress under an active shooter incident is something called the general adaptation syndrome. And everyone remembers this from when they were in, in high school, probably in biology. Uh, it, it's a, the fright, flight, fight reaction to stress. It's a natural reaction to a threat. So I want you to put yourself in the classroom as a teacher and you're going to go through this reaction, but you're going to have to deal with the same reaction with 20 students staring back at you. Okay, so, so you have someone coming to the classroom brandishing a weapon. You're going to go through this fright, flight, fight reaction. What happens is your body essentially drugs itself, which is going to make it extremely hard to react in a normal fashion, which you would like to. What happens is the brain processes these threat signals, it begins in the amygdala and then the hypothalamus, and your body releases something called ACTH, adrenocorticotropic hormone. It's a stress hormone. It does a lot of interesting things. This cortisol and adrenaline are designed to keep you alive. So it's just a biological response designed to keep you alive. Animals go through a very similar, if not identical, process. Since you have to run really fast or fight really hard, the body prepares itself by releasing this ACTH. Some of the physical effects, your heart rate increases, and obviously that's to give your large muscle groups more oxygen, more energy. Uh, your hands start to shake as a result of the ACTH. You get a dry mouth. Um, your, your vision goes to a tunnel vision because all you really need to do is concentrate on that threat. So you kind of lose your peripheral vision. At the same time, your pupils will dilate to let more light in, more, more information. And, and this is all good. Um, the liver releases glucose, which gives you more energy. So these are all necessary for you to ramp up your ability to either run really fast or fight really hard. The real problem is that your body also starts shutting down non-essential systems. And the, the systems that shutting down arguably may not be that non-essential. Uh, first of all, your bladder will relax. And if you've ever seen an animal Right before, when they get terrified, right before they run away or fly away, often they will, they will vent, uh, they'll go to the bathroom when they, when they leave. People do the same thing. If you've ever heard someone say, oh, I'm so scared, I peed my pants. This is just part of the ACTH -A uh, reaction. You also have slow digestion. So for some of you, you'll hear your, you know, when you get threatened, you feel your heart rate increase, and then you get the butterflies in your stomach. Digestion is not required when you're either running really fast or fighting really hard to deal with that threat. Uh, so what's happening is blood's being shunted away from your stomach and your, and your digestive tract. Uh, your hearing actually diminishes as well because that's not an essential function when you see a threat right in front of your face. Um, this, this is, you can deal with all these things. The real problem though is that your prefrontal cortex starts to suffer a little bit. Uh, the prefrontal cortex is where the higher level decisions are made in the brain. Well, you don't have to make higher level decisions. All you have to do is you have to either run really hard or fight really, run really fast or, or fight really hard. So the blood that's being shunted away from your prefrontal cortex is, is uh, this can be a problem, especially when you have 20 other kids who are going through the same problem. Some are wanting to run, some are, you know, uh, wanting to fight. Uh, some curl up into a ball and cry. So you're going to have to deal with that. 
there's two other things that happen that we don't typically talk about when we're talking about the flight or flight syndrome, and that's a freeze response. Some people, when they get extremely terrified, are unable to move. Uh, this is this is a common thing in nature as well. If you think about a deer in the headlights or a uh, a rabbit um, that's freezes in front of you on a dark road at, at night, they just freeze. They're terrified. They can't move. People will do the same thing. Posturing, on the other hand, if you've ever seen two cats get into a fight, they'll puff up. Their tails get big and they get really loud. Uh, they arch their backs. Well, people will do the same thing. They don't want to fight. If you've seen two teenagers squaring off against each other. It can almost look comical, but the bottom line is they're trying to posture and intimidate the other person. This doesn't sound like a bad thing, but when you think about a student who might have a, a sister or a little brother in a classroom down the hallway and all they want to do is go down and protect them, then you have to deal with that as well. So there's a lot of things going on in this classroom that you're going to have to be prepared to deal with. There's three methods to control this internally. They're not foolproof, they're not fail safe. But if you can do this when you start feeling your heart beating or your stomach starting to get those butterflies inside, then you'll have a better chance at getting some blood back to your prefrontal cortex and making some higher level decisions uh, that make sense. The three methods of self-control. Number one is breathing. Uh, in the military and in uh, uh, professional sports teams, fire, police, they teach a method called four and fours. You want to use diaphragmatic breathing, which means your stomach goes out when you breathe in, not your chest. And you breathe in and count to four. So you count 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000 as you're breathing in. And then naturally breathe out 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 4,000. And you do that four times. While you're breathing, you're counting to yourself. So the combination of this rhythmic breathing and the counting takes your mind away from the stressful incident and also uh, starts to flood your, your, your brain with a little bit more blood, okay, more oxygen. The second thing you do is, is called positive self-talk. Most people have something that they tell themselves when they start getting in a stressful situation. And in my classes, I like to find out what those things are. Uh, sometimes it's as simple as, you know, you got this, or uh, it this will be over soon. My, my, I use the example, my girlfriend re repeats her social security number to herself, which I thought was kind of funny, but she's a numbers person, and she was also a paratrooper, so she's used to dealing with stressful situations. But the key here is positive self-talk and get your, get, getting your mind, again, off of this stressful incident, okay? The third thing is called grounding. Most of us who have uh, given a presentation in school have, have dealt with this and you didn't even know it. Grounding is when you have an object in your hand or you have, uh, you have something that you can control. You grab, put your hand in your pocket and you grab a, a pocket full of, uh, or grab a, a pocket full of change or uh, grab your belt while you're doing a presentation. And if you remember this, the first time you gave that presentation in school, probably in sixth grade, like I was, I think I was giving a presentation on the city of Ur, and I had the three by five cards in my hand, and I was crunching them and grinding them, and, and they were all sweaty and mooned at the end. But just holding on to something, anything, gives you a feeling of control. Uh, the stress typically results in the feeling of loss of control. So if you can control something, even a, a pen that you click repeatedly or Again, like holding your belt, it's going to give you some feeling of control over the situation. So the three things you need to do to control yourself under an extremely stressful situation is, number one, breathing, do your four and fours. Uh, two, make sure you have something that you repeatedly say to yourself, um, positive self-talk. And then three is grounding. Hold on to something, uh, crunch your toes up in your shoes, whatever you can do to, to control part of your body or something that you're holding and that will help you through that. Um, before we get into school shootings, I, I need, to, you know, the, uh, the Columbine 911 tape. I have to tell you a story about how hard controlling your stress reaction is. When I was a young soldier, uh, I went to Iraq, and I'd been in the Army for about five years, and I was, it was, uh, we were in a place called Zako, and we were way out in northern Iraq, near the border of Turkey, and it was a pretty secure area. 
And at that point, we were only required to wear a physical training uniform and carry an M16 with one magazine. Um, we had Spanish paratroopers on the perimeter pulling security for us. And so we could do physical training in the evening and kind of do what we wanted to do. Uh, one particular night, it was a nice, hot, dry evening. It was dark outside. And I walked across the compound to a row of latrines on the perimeter and was inside the latrine when I heard some firing. Uh, so being a naturally curious, curious paratrooper, I stepped outside and I saw a bunch of red tracers going out and green tracers coming in. So we were being attacked. And uh, I was watching these tracers thinking, wow, it's, that's kind of cool. You know, they're pretty, you know, it's kind of like fireworks. And I'm watching these tracers fly through the air when all of a sudden a bunch of uh, bullets hit a corrugated steel building that I was standing next to. You know, which was very loud and sparks flew. And I thought, you know what, this isn't um, all that smart to be standing here admiring this uh, fireworks show. So I got down and I crawled over to the lowest, uh, this, the uh, the low concrete uh, base of this building. And I hid there for a while until the firing subsided. And then I ran back across the uh, compound to the main building where the other soldiers were already starting to kick out the windows and return fire. So we went through this. No one got hurt, fortunately. And then the next day, I was sitting around with my friends, kind of discussing what had happened. And I, I realized that despite all the training I'd had, uh, I, I was not prepared for that action. And I walked out and watched the fighting start. I'd already been in the Army, like I said, for five years. And I was in charge of soldiers in a combat zone. So just be aware that if something like this happens, Oftentimes, a school shooting is, is going to be an unbelievable event. You're not going to want to accept what's happening. And then when you do, you're, you're likely not going to react the way you would like to, uh, which is why it's important to remember those three things you can do when you're placed under that stressful situation. So what I'd like to do now is I would like to go ahead and I'd like to play 911 recording. Uh, this is Patty. She was an art teacher at Columbine. She was walking around the school and heard a bunch of noise outside, which she at first thought was a senior prank. Uh, she walked out to the double doors with another student, and as she approached the glass doors, the glass exploded from the shooters shooting in towards the school. She got shrapnel in her shoulder, and she and the uh, she and the student ran down the hallway, alerting other students, and she ended up in the library with 52 students and three other staff members. So let's listen to what uh, Patty had to say to the 911 operator. Jefferson County 911. Yes, I'm a teacher from the Columbine High School. There is a student here with a gun. He was shot out of window. I believe one of the students. I don't know what's in my shoulder. Okay, has anybody been injured? Yes. Okay. Yes. And the floor is in a panic, and I'm in the library. I thought, I'm going to stand under the table, sit. Hands under the table. Um, this is screaming, and this is just, um, uh, you know, trying to take the children. We need to be telling Okay. We're getting them there. Who is the student, ma'am? I do not know who the student is. Okay. I saw a student. I thought I was in the Oh, my God. Okay. I was on my body. I saw a guy. Okay. I don't think I'm going to go out there. 
So when you when you listen to poor Patty, you can hear definitely hear the stress in her voice. She's having a stress reaction, uh, but she's actually doing an excellent job at communicating what's going on with the 911 operator. The one thing that you hear her repeatedly say is, get on the floor, students stay on the floor. She was on the phone with 911 for four minutes and 10 seconds before the shooters entered the library. And out of the 12 people killed in Columbine, 10 of those were in the library. The students came in and began shooting the students, walking around, telling the jocks to stand up. And other students uh, would try and uh, protect their fellow students. Uh, some actually engage with the shooters. Uh, one tried to, to uh, attack one of the one of the students or one of the shooters and, and was was killed. Uh, some of the students talked to them as friends and they let one of their friends walk out of the library. Um, the interesting thing is that while this went on, uh, there had been an open and unlocked door in the back of the classroom. So for the four minutes and 10 seconds that they had before the shooters entered, uh, they, they could have gotten everyone out of that classroom or out of that library. The, the issue here is that after the fact, we can, we can look and we can say, hey, look, you know, Patty did a terrible job and she should have just gotten everyone out. But you have to, you have to understand that this was a, a typical reaction to an sh active shooter event. The, the teachers were taught, put people on the floor, put people under desks. And that's exactly what you do if that's what you've been trained. The students that walked out and the students that ran survived. There were over 400 students in the cafeteria when the shooting started. And in fact, the attack was supposed to be initiated with two large propane bombs in the cafeteria, which would have killed the majority of those students. Fortunately, those didn't go off. But a teacher that realized what was going on early evacuated every single student from that cafeteria before the shooters came in and they all survived. So what we have to do is we have to make sure that we're giving those options to our employees. And we're not training them to uh, follow the old outdated lockdown procedures. Let's talk about Sandy Hook for a minute. Sandy Hook was a, uh, a terrible situation. Uh, everyone remembers the day it happened. Uh, Basically what happened is the shooter accessed the school by shooting through a brand new security window and door access that was in place to protect against active shooter incidents. And so the idea was the person would have to come and ring in and they could look out with the camera and decide whether or not to let this person in. The shooter knew that, shot through the security glass, reached in, opened up the glass or the, opened up the door and came in. The first three people that came out to see what was going on was the principal, assistant principal, and school, school psychiatrist. They stepped out and he shot all three of them. That set into motion a series of events, uh, including uh, teachers attempting to hide the students in classroom bathrooms, uh, hide them under desks. Uh, one school or one, one classroom, the first one on the right as the shooter came in, had actually left a piece of black paper over the small window in the door. And so from a, from a previous active shooter uh, practice, and he passed that doorway thinking that, probably thinking that there was no one in there. Uh, the unsettling thing about this is that most of the students that were shot were shot numerous times. And along with the same uh, theme is that Virginia Tech is that most of them were shot fatally in the chest or in the head, which will tell you that they were easy targets. They were sitting on the floor. Uh, they weren't moving. They were hiding instead of running. When you talk about Virginia Tech, the shooter shot two students in a dorm and then went to a three-story uh, three uh, building on campus where he chained the main entrance shut with a bomb with, a, with a, uh, a sign on the door that said that if these uh, doors are 
uh, opened and a bomb will go off. And they went upstairs to the second floor and he walked up and down the hallway looking in the classrooms. Uh, later, a student said he, they thought it was strange for someone to be looking in the classrooms because it was late in the semester and they should already know where they're going. But what he was actually doing is he was looking for a classroom with the most students in it uh, to pick a classroom with a lot of easy targets. The first classroom that he went to, he shot, killed virtually everyone in that classroom. They had no reaction time. And then uh, the second classroom he went into, he shot six uh, and wounded less. And then from there on, every classroom that had had a chance to barricade the doors, there were fewer students shot and wounded in those classrooms. And one student, one classroom actually had barricaded the door with a heavy table and every single student jumped out the window and everyone survived. The, the uh, interesting thing in some of these situations is you'll have a teacher holding the door shut and they typically get shot and injured or killed. Uh, so barricading is an important way, an important opportunity for you to, uh, to keep that shooter from coming in or at least slow them down. And although there were people injured jumping out the windows, uh, you know, a sprayed or broken ankle is better than being shot at close range. So when you look at all these different school shootings, you can see that there's kind of a theme. If, if you sit and wait, if you hide, if you, if you don't use some kind of barrier, or some kind of protection, then you're going to be much more likely to get shot and killed. And remember, 60% of active shooter incidents actually end before the police arrive. So you are the first responder again. Some of these other active shooter incidents I alluded to earlier, I can't stress this enough, you have to be prepared to do this anywhere. So talk to your family and friends. Run, hide, fight is the Department of Homeland Security's answer to an active shooter scenario. It, and there's a lot of different acronyms and a lot of different things that uh, these security agencies are coming up with. Department of Ed, as I said, adopted run, hide, fight back in 2014. The Department of Justice, Department of Homeland Security, FEMA, a lot of these organizations are actually competing with each other, trying to come up with the best plans, best policies, and best procedures. Uh, but they all pretty much go back to this run, hide, fight concept. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about Alice. Uh, just in case anyone wants more information, you can go to alicetraining.com. On the, on the internet and uh, there's classes that you can take. There's instructor certification courses. There's online training for your, for your employees. It's a, a great option for you. It's just one of the many options. ALA stands for Alert, Lockdown, Inform, Counter, and Evacuate, as you can see on the slide. Um, these are not done in order and these are your options. So we're going to go through each one of these. The first one is an alert. In an active shooter scenario, what's going to happen is you're going to be alerted somehow that it's going on. It might not seem like it at first. You might not be exactly certain, uh, but a, it could be a gunshot. It could be a PA announcement. Uh, it could be someone coming to your room and telling you that there's an a, a active shooter scenario going down. Uh, what you want to do is make sure that you're avoiding the use of code words. When you do have an active shooter scenario going down, you want to make sure that you're using plain language. Uh, especially since a lot of people may not believe it's happening and they want to go out and investigate uh, to get more information or they just want to continue with what they're doing. The next one is lockdown. You have to understand here that we're not talking about just locking the door and sitting down with the lights off. What we have to do is we have to barricade the door. Remember, a lot of these active shooter scenarios happen very quickly. Um, Sandy Hook only took 11 minutes. The average active shooter scenario lasts five to seven minutes, and the killing portion of that, during the killing portion, two to three people are killed every minute. So if you start doing the math, the more you barricade, the more you slow them down, the longer it's going to take. Shooters know this too. So what they're going to do is they're going to look for easy targets. They're not going to mess with a door that's completely barricaded and jammed up. So what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to take every single thing you can in that classroom that's big and heavy and barricade that door. Um, what you also have to understand is that you need to use cover and concealment. So when you're in the classroom after barricading this door or anytime when you're trying to avoid a shooter, you're going to have to remain concealed. So it's something that prevents being observed. Uh, so they cannot observe you through, for instance, um, 
bushes outside or around a wall in the classroom. Even if it won't stop bullets, it's still concealment and they won't be able to accurately target you. As far as cover goes, it's something that stops small arm rounds like um, like a sm uh, small arms rifle bullet or a pistol. Even a thick book will stop a, a pistol round. Uh, so cover and concealment is extremely important. You want to get down low, find something to put between you and the shooter, a bookcase or um, a desk or something of that nature. Remember when you're locking down, if you make it too hard to get in, you also make it impossible to get out. So you want to make sure that you have an alternate means of egress, possibly through a window or another door in the room that they, uh, the active shooter wouldn't have access to. One of the things that I, I repeat to my classes is this inform aspect of Alice. You have to communicate. There's no other way to get information to make your decision unless someone is communicating with you and then you're passing that information on to other people. When you do communicate, if you know the location of the shooter, you have to put that out, be it, be it by cell phone, email. Uh, there's a lot of different ways to do this, but you have to make sure that you're sending information out that's clear and concise. Description of the shooter, uh, a guy in a white t-shirt with a rifle. Um, he's moving down the west hallway towards building five. But you have to be very specific and uh, make sure that you're using clear, direct language. If you're hiding, you shouldn't be talking out loud. So uh, you can call 911 and you can mute your phone so they can hear you, but you can't hear them. Thus, the, the shooter can't hear them speaking either. They'll know what's going on, but you have to open that channel of communication and then when it's safe, give them some information. The biggest thing that we'll have to deal with is the questions about a counter. Why would we counter? Why would we want to fight? We're not going to teach people how to fight. Really, what we're trying to do is we're trying to disrupt their ability to target us. Um, that means they have to observe, orient, decide, and act. Uh, it's called the OODA loop. And when you orient that process of targeting, they have to start back at the very beginning. So what you're trying to do is, as a last resort, delay and distract that shooter. No one's going to ever expect someone who's disarmed and doesn't have any weapons to take out an armed attacker. Using improvised weapons in the classroom uh, could include throwing a, a coffee cup, uh, books, screaming, yelling, throwing books, pushing things towards the attacker. Anything you can to disrupt that targeting process called the OODA loop. And then if you are close enough, using weight and leverage instead of trying to overpower them, but attaching to the long guns, their arms, legs, and then pulling them down using your body weight, and then essentially standing on their head or neck. You control their head, you control their body. Uh, what you're really trying to do here is you're trying to give the students an opportunity to run. Uh, there are several different instances of active shooters being neutralized by a, a teacher. The most important thing is remember to evacuate. This is your first priority. Use time and distance. Get away, and then just the movement makes it harder for them to track you and shoot you. Run it when you think it's safe. This is when you have to start exercising those options, but it is a scary thing because now you have to think for yourself and live with your decision. Using non-traditional exits is, is a good idea because they're not going to expect you to go out that way. And then you'll go to your predetermined rally points, which is determined in your policy and your practice. Remember using cover and concealment. And when you run out, don't carry anything in your hands. Even if you've disarmed that attacker, uh, don't carry anything. Cell phones, nothing goes out. You can come out with your hands up because if you do have first responders coming, they don't know who the shooter is and they could potentially think you're the shooter and then take you out. Make sure you're taking all the directions from the first responders that are arriving and don't expect the first ones there to help you. Their mission is to go in and take out that shooter. So what can you do to protect everyone? We talked about awareness training. You can use the run, hide, fight training, Alice training, develop your plans and rehearsals, and then communicate with the employees in the community on a regular basis. All these active shooter situations are different. The typical scenarios that I would do in the, in the training would be a traditional lockdown, a barricade. So you'd allow the teachers uh, and the employees to hide in the classroom and barricade the doors. Then you have a decision scenario where you get, they get to decide whether to lock down or evacuate based on where they think the shooter's at. 
and then of course counter. Uh, people that can do this training for you would be your local police department. Uh, Alice will come and do a training session for you, or you can have your own person go to Alice and get certified, uh, or even a JPA like our JPA. I do the trainings for our districts free of charge. And uh, we're getting close on time right now, so I just want to talk to you guys uh, real quick about prevention. The basic uh, way that you have an active shooter situation develop is someone gets an idea, a student feels upset. Um, sometimes we're not really sure how this comes about. Other times it's very obvious, but they get an idea in their head that they want to shoot up the school. They plan anywhere from two days to 14 months. So someone doesn't just get angry and that same day come back and shoot the school up. These usually take a long time to plan. They must have some type of access to guns or weapons, which actually regardless of gun laws, is act it's quite easy to access a gun or a weapon and then the action, the incident occurs. The interesting clues here is that 80% of the time, an active shooter will tell some person, one person, that they're going to do it. And 62% tell more than one person, which is really telling, what's really interesting when you start looking at these uh, possibilities where they could have been prevented. A lot of these could have been prevented by someone just saying something that they've heard someone else talking about. It's easy to look on social media and see you know, what kind of uh, information and pictures people are posting. If you see something that makes the hair stand up on the back of your neck, you need to say something and then get your, uh, uh, get your threat assessment team to check into it. Frequently, these students that are active shooters are uh, victims of bullying and have social and academic problems. And they will also frequently rehearse and practice and then put those videos online. So you have to have a process where you're identifying these shooters beforehand. You're not profiling, but you're paying attention to your gut feelings. And if something doesn't look right, have the moral courage to say something and then investigate. You should develop a threat assessment team. REMS, the Readiness and Emergency Management for School program, it has a great training program and will send people to your school district and train you on how to develop a threat assessment team. It's free. Uh, get to know your people, not just your students, but your parents and your staff as well. And there's n just uh, over communicate. You have, to, you have to be comfortable talking about this because it's something that's not easy to discuss. It's something that you guys have to start talking about. Um, there's a bunch of different resources out there, it, literally hundreds of resources online. Sandy Hook Promise is great. They've got a lot of videos and a lot of different resources for you. Uh, let's see something, say something.net, that's great information. There's apps like Stop It and Catapult EMS, which will help you communicate during an active shooter incident and also allow students to report other students uh, if they are showing suicidal ideation or some type of uh, threatening behavior. And then, of course, the different uh, government organizations and training organizations, including ALICE, the California uh, Department of Education, REMS, uh, legendfo.com for all your policies and, and laws. And uh, so, Please go ahead and uh, access these resources. And remember, uh, prevention is much better than reaction. And uh, that's some, in summary, that's, uh, that's what I have for you. So I guess we'll open this up to questions. We have about five minutes left. Thank you so much, Kurt. Um, so I'll be, now be asking Kurt to answer a few of the questions from our Q&A box. Um, if you do have any questions or comments, go ahead and click the Q&A tab right below these slides and enter them now. Because we're running short on time, I have to kind of just answer a few, but I will try to get to as many as I can. Um, so also, I will be posting Kurt's resources to our COEH website for everyone to be able to access um, if you need it in the future. So Kurt, um, one of the first questions that we had um, are, what are your thoughts on the NRA Active Shooter School Safety Program? Any active shooter programs, as long as they follow something along the lines of run, hide, fight, are going to be beneficial. And, and like I said earlier, there's literally dozens of different programs. They use different acronyms. But if it goes back to giving teachers an option to exercise something other than the standard lockdown, I'm all for it. Okay, thank you. 
Um, also, um, I have a question here asking, um, what examples of mass notification systems um, have been used in some of the schools that you serve, um, such as text or sending alerts to mobile devices? Great. Now, I'm not obviously uh, getting paid to do any of this. Um, I can only tell you what I've seen our schools use. Uh, Catapult is a really good app from what I've heard. I've, I've seen a demonstration of it at one of our larger school districts, and they're thinking of starting that. Um, and you got to remember when we're talking about preparing these tactical response plans or active shooter plans, it's going to be based on specific needs in the context of each school and community. I have school districts that don't have enough money for a PA system because they're single school districts out in the woods and they literally use a megaphone. Uh, so you're going to have to use whatever resources you have available. Uh, apps are great. Remember, not everyone's going to have a cell phone or have access to a cell phone. And then during these incidents, uh, cell phone towers will go down. Uh, so at Tehama, for instance, they used VoIP, so voice over internet, to call out because all the telephone lines were jammed. Uh, it, it's going to be up to you, your board, and how much money you guys have to decide what kind of apps and uh, resources you're going to be able to use. Okay, thank you. Let's see, one more is, um, so uh, do you have um, any idea of maybe current grants that are uh, working on providing school safety? Uh, there are free things online. Um, I, I, I'll tell you that like REMS, for instance, if, if government programs like REMS exist everywhere and that you could just tap into them, you get, I mean, you guys would be just saving money left and right and, and answering the call here for safety. Uh, it's, it's just going to be some, it's going to take some research on your, on your behalf. I know that some of the inner cities have programs. There's one that was uh, released several years ago for the Bay Area, and I can't remember the acronym. But again, using the internet and doing a web search uh, is probably your best bet. So I'm sorry, I don't have exact uh, names or links for you. No, that's okay. Okay, and so I'll answer one more question. I'm sorry, I can't get to all of them. Um, uh, Sherry asked, um, you said don't use code word. So the overhead page should uh, simply state active shooter or active killer, or what do you suggest? That's a great question. You know, code words are confusing. And remember, if you have um, a, a, basically a reduction in cognition because there's no blood in your prefrontal cortex, you're not going to be able to deci decipher those code words. So active shooter, uh, plain language, there's an active shooter in the office wearing a white t-shirt uh, and he's got a rifle and he's moving towards building three. So that's the plain language is really key and essential. That's what you're going to have to relay to those other people so they know that it's not a mistake or a joke or they're trying to figure out what's going on. They already know. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Kurt. I really appreciate you coming um, on here today and giving everybody this valuable information. Um, I want to thank everybody who joined us here for today's webinar. Um, the COH hosts webinars on the first Wednesday of every month from 12 p.m. to 1 p.m. Pacific. Next month, we'll be joined by Alan Barr, who will be presenting on uh, respirable silica dust exposure during drilling into concrete. We've also recently launched a new ergonomics webinar series in cooperation with NIOSH Education and Research Centers throughout the country. These webinars take place on the third Wednesday of each month. We hope to see you back on Wednesday, April 17th for our upcoming NIOSH ergonomics webinar, Vehicle Seat Design, Whole Body Vibration, and Low Back Pain with Dr. Pete Johnson from Berkeley's Occupational and Environmental Exposure Sciences Program in the School of Public Health. Be sure to check our website for more information and the resources from today's presentation, and also to register for future webinars at coeh.berkeley.edu. Thank you again for your wonderful questions and participation in today's webinar. Everyone enjoy the rest of your day.